that hurt our economy, that destroy jobs, that are the reverse of, of, of allowing the private sector to, to, to create jobs. So I think that gives you a feel. The last one that I'll put, which is kind of embodied in the first one, but it's the value side too. I, I am a strong proponent that exceptionalism uh, is something that is special for this country, that we do have an obligation to be the strongest in the world, both militarily and economically, and that we should unabashedly seek to have our country be number one in the world. Uh, yes. um, I appreciate the question that was that was put out there. Could, could we talk a little bit, just getting off, uh, expanding the question a little bit, about filibustering itself? You know, back in the day, like when Mr. Smith went to Washington, if he opposed a bill, he had to literally stand up there and read the phone book or whatever and run the clock out. Now it's a matter of how many numbers you actually have sitting in the chamber, in the upper chamber of the Senate, uh, that allows a bill to come to the floor. Uh, in the days of the civil rights, we know uh, the story of the late Senator Byrd that filibustered as a Democrat against the Civil Rights Amendment. What are your thoughts about going back to that old style of filibustering where, in fact, if you have some passion against legislation that's being introduced on the floor, then you stand up and you are forced to express that, that emotion, your opposition, vehemently, orally, or read the phone book, or whatever. What are your thoughts about the rules of the Senate as it is now? I, I love the idea that you have to actually put your actions where your mouth is. Um, so that all of a sudden there is a cost to taking a stand. I think that is great. So I love that issue. I, I can tell you that's something that I've done before. Uh, that city of Dallas, we had an issue come forward, which was just a wrong issue. It had to do with taking a bunch of contracts and not bidding them out, but giving to some people. Um, when I took that issue up, I was down 14 to 1. I ended up winning it. And I ended up winning it by taking the issue to the people and engaging them and having them understand it. So I think part of it is not only the issue of on the floor of filibustering, but being aggressive enough to take issues to the people and engage them. I've said often that the, the first bill that I would ever put forward is a bill that says you're going to restructure Congress. And I think the way that you do that is simply by saying that benefits, health care, um, uh, pensions, et cetera, can be no better than the midpoint of the private sector. and. If somebody's elected to Congress, they can't lobby on anything associated federally for 10 years to try to, again, get them out of there. <laughs> you want to follow up? You want to follow up? Thank you, thank you. All right, new question. Okay, Mr. Addison. Um, let's, let's, let me stay with that theme a little bit. Yeah, because there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, I think there's a, uh, a lack of, uh, Republicans' ability to message very well. We don't message very well. So let me ask this question this way. Um, the Constitution says that all bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives. The 16th Amendment says Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on incomes. Article 1, Section 8 gives Congress the authority to make all laws necessary and proper for executing its powers, in other words, to spend money. So my point, of course, is that of the three branches of Congress, of government, Congress taxes and Congress spends. Um, we tend to talk about presidential budgets and presidential administrations as being responsible for the state of the economy when in fact he can sign or not sign and that's about the size of it, right? So Democrats have controlled both houses, both houses of Congress for 44 of the last 55 years. Based on that, if you're elected, how will you help Americans understand which party is responsible for the state we're in? What was the last part of the question? <laughs> if you're elected as a Republican and talking about messaging, how will you help Americans understand which party is responsible for the state we're in? Well, I will tell you that I think that it's um, proper that one should ask forgiveness. To, to say that you have never made any mistakes, I think, is wrong. And as a Christian, I'm so thankful for forgiveness. Uh, and that song, Amazing Grace, was written for me. But with regard to what has been happening, it's unconscionable what both parties have been doing for the last many years. And it is because of, I believe, career politicians. You know, I wish I could have been asked about term limits. I would have told you not to do that. 
But, but I think that that's, it also gets back to the filibuster, and that is where you'll recall in that 1939 movie, which was before the days of television, that the ears of the American people were right there by their radios because they were listening to what Senator Smith was up to, and the people were with him because he was fighting corruption and he was calling attention to the problems that existed in that body. Now, I, you, you may think this is funny, but I have literally been engineering in my mind a device that would help me if I were to collapse or begin to collapse to, to be held up through a stainless steel frame that comes up through my pants and underneath my leg to stand as long as it takes to call attention to what's happening. But it must be done through communication, and that is where one person in the United States Senate has a profound influence on national policy. Follow up. All right, we'll go to a new question now. New question, Ms. Pittington. Um, we're well aware of the role that U.S. Senate plays in confirming uh, nominees to the Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court. Which U.S. Supreme Court justice, current or past, would you say that you identify with in regarding their view of uh, the Constitution and how it's interpreted? Oh, gosh. There's some very interesting people there. And, I mean, right now, I really love Scalia. I mean, talk about a man after my own heart. I think he's amazing. I don't agree with him all the time, and even when he, the logic he uses to come to his decision, I may agree with the decision in the end, but I may not agree with the steps he got to. Uh, but right now, really him. Um, I think he's had to stand in a way and in a time that previous justices may not even be able to comprehend. I really respect what he's done, and I look forward to the day when there's an equally passionate conservative woman there to help him along with it. Uh, just to follow up, Ms. Pinninger, um, what specifically about Scalia could you elaborate on as far as a case or what? Right. That he's a strict constitutionalist from top to bottom. I love the story of talking about the American flag and whether or not people could burn it. And he believed in he, freedom of speech and he believed in it very literally. And so he ruled in a way that he hated but he believed was the most literal interpretation of the Constitution. And the next day, it was all over the news. And he's in there drinking his coffee, and he just feels this huge weight on him about it. And his wife walks in and starts singing the national anthem. <laughs> he's had to carry weight, even with people that he loves who may disagree with the final decision he's made, and I really respect that. All right. Let's go to a new question now. Uh, Joan Cruz. Um, let's talk monetary policy. Really simple. If you could, for those of us who don't have a strong grasp on monetary policy, could you please tell us the role of the Federal Reserve? <laughs> I am glad to, and I will say at the outset that if I'm fortunate enough to be elected to the Senate, I intend to be a co-sponsor of Ron Paul's Audit the Fed Bill. The Federal Reserve has its origins in progressivism, and it has its origins in dramatically expanding the control of unelected elites over our monetary system and over our money base. I am deeply concerned about the lack of transparency and accountability at the Federal Reserve, and in particular, I am concerned about the policies pursued recently, uh, euphemistically called quantitative easing, but in the English language called printing money. <laughs> when the federal government prints money and prints money, it is the cruelest tax imaginable because it makes everyone's incomes, everyone's assets, everyone's homes, everyone's property and savings they've worked a lifetime to accumulate to provide for their family. It undermines the value of all of it. And I think we should fight against undermining our currency, which the Federal Reserve has been doing every bit as vigorously as we fight against out-of-control federal government spending and taxation. Could you share with us your thoughts, uh, if, if, if we can go beyond editing, uh, auditing the Federal Reserve, uh, hopefully ending the Federal Reserve, could you share with us your thoughts about uh, recoupling our currency to uh, precious metal, namely gold, 
um, would you also um, be in favor of uh, opening up the uh, gates of Fort Knox and seeing if the gold is actually still there? <laughs> there are those of us who think it may have already been spent. Uh, could you just share your heart with us on that? On number two, absolutely. Uh, on number one, I, that's an issue, frankly, that, that I want to hear more expert advice on. Uh, I am sympathetic to the arguments of returning to the gold standard, but at the same time, I want to consider carefully the effect of that in a global currency. What I am not sympathetic to is the arguments for a weak and undermined dollar. And so whatever it takes to ensure we have a strong dollar that is not undermined through inflation, that is not undermined through printing too much money, that is not undermined in a way that it becomes an excuse. What this is all about is politicians like to spend our money. And it's an avenue for them to do so. And so if returning to the gold standard is the only effective way to ensure sound money, then I would support it. But regardless, we need to ensure a sound and stable dollar that doesn't undermine all of our savings. Yeah, just one, just one, because we, we really haven't touched the monetary and fiscal policy, and it's something that you guys are going to, if elected, are going to have a profound impact upon. Um, the rights of individual states to um, have their own gold reserves. Uh, there are those of us here in the state of Texas that believe that uh, we should have our own gold reserves with the potential of being able to use it as legal tender. Uh, just in case America just happens to go belly up and all we got left is Texas. <laughs> uh, once again, just based on um, my loony comment, what are your thoughts? You know, I have to admit, the first thing I thought of is in my office, on the wall, I have an original $50 bill, $20 bill, $10 bill, and $5 bill that was legal tender in the Republic of Texas when we were our own nation. And I have more than once thought, if we continue down the road President Obama has us on, I may well need to break that over, and at least I've got $85 to hold us through. All right, so we go to a new question now. Mr. Lefford, please. Could you please tell us what you think the United States energy policy should be? Sure. Uh, it should be common sense. And that's where we need to go. Uh, unfortunately, what, what's happened is we have walked away from any sense of common sense on energy. This isn't a question of coming up with thousands of pages of new policies and those sorts of things. It's simply leveraging off the existing reserves that we have and exploiting those. We have enormous reserves of oil that right now the EPA and a number of other agencies in Alaska and in Texas are standing in front of. While we continue to import five and a half million barrels a day from, nicely put, people that don't want like us and want to do us harm. Amen. In addition to that, we have enormous reserves of natural gas. 30, 40 years ago, we thought maybe it was 50 years. Now you will see estimates that go up towards 400 years. More of those are probably in the, in the 100 years. What we need to do is simply utilize those reserves. If we do, and in a very short period of time, we could break the back of the oil that we import from the Middle East. At five and a half million, you could take it down by a million, million and a half. Anybody that knows commodity markets would understand that you've broken that. So use common sense, leverage off the reserves, and importantly, the last part, utilize market forces. I'm happy to see any energy source be utilized but it has to stand on its own economic value. Any follow up on that? Next question. Good question. Mr. Addison, um, what we have found out over the years is that Planned Parenthood has been receiving millions, hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars even though we have policy in place that, that those tax dollars are not supposed to be used for elective abortions. And they say they provide other services, and so they've been able to get at this money. Um, my question to you is, number one, do you support any tax dollars being given to Planned Parenthood for any reason? And, and if you do or don't, or if you don't, what would you do 
to make that happen or to put that policy in place? I absolutely would not favor one dime to them. And the way, I've mentioned a few of these things in previous minutes, but the only way that we can truly defeat those types of issues is to decentralize Washington. If we uh, give the powers back to the states with all of these issues that deal with health and, and, and other issues that, that Planned Parenthood is allegedly involved in, then the state, the federal government will no longer be cutting checks to Planned Parenthood. The states will have the right to make those decisions and then again in Texas if our legislators were to decide to send any money to them I do believe that the people would rise up and throw the rascals out uh, and so absolutely they must not be given any money it, it must be uh, ways must be figured out to stop it from happening and I think the way to do that is to transfer the powers back to the state and get this massive government uh, neutered if you will. <laughs> And just a follow-up question, is there anything that you could share with us that you've been involved in personally on the pro-life issue to either stop this type of funding or to be involved in other actions to support uh, life of unborn children? Well, I have stood many times uh, at, with my friends down the street at, uh, in Magnolia, it's right down the street from my funeral home at St. Matthias Catholic Church. Every year they have uh, the chain for life. And they hold up signs talking about the sanctity of life and how abortion is, is the taking of an unborn life. And so I have stood and, and applauded them and appreciate their example of standing up for something that must be stopped. Uh, I have also um, made donations to uh, the various organizations that do promote life. Uh, outside of that, I have not been to Austin or to Washington, but I've stood with local people and done those things. question and uh, then we'll move into the uh, closing statements. Leela May? <laughs> yes, Claire. <laughs> what should America's depth of participation be within the United Nations? Oh, wow. Let me let me really gather all my strength when they say this. None. <laughs> Quite frankly, and I'm going to steal this from Glenn, but I'm going to give him credit. Quite frankly, when we invite people who spy on us, hate us, and violate every one of our laws and rules when they're here, we are begging for trouble. Enough. No more money. No more money to the International Monetary Fund, which really becomes the International Bankers Fund. No more of our troops serving in wars that, quite frankly, have continued to put in regimes that look to supplant the United States. Enough. Enough of this leading from behind. You believe in a cause so much, you want to be at the back of the line to defend it. I will not vote to send our men and women abroad unless I believe in a cause enough that I would join up, stand on the front line, and take the first bullet. Yes, ma'am. And I'm a pretty good shot, too. I have a, a follow-up. Ms. Pittinger, could you name specifically one or, or more wars that you caught now or in the past that you would you have or would object to or you'd say we shouldn't be involved in? Well, some of us would say we are in five wars right now, but Congress actually has to declare a war for it to be considered a war. Uh, I, I think they call it what a kinetic skirmish. What you know, I don't know whatever ridiculous words they make up. When that's what happens when you have an entire party of attorneys, they make up new ways to say real things. Uh, so I would say, actually, out of Iraq, we mission accomplished. We wanted to remove Saddam Hussein. It's time for us to come home. We are trying to rebuild a nation that right now is not interested in doing anything but fraudulently spend our money. And I'm sorry for the people who live there, but they've got to change their government. We haven't been able to do it effectively. Corruption is deep within, and we're not changing. We can get out of Iraq, Afghanistan. We can get out of Libya. Quite frankly, we need to take all of our troops home. They, they deserve to be with their families. The, the, argument, the, the argument is often put out there when you look at the tragedies that befall people, especially in poverty-stricken countries, yes. um, that 
America has the ability to, to assist somehow. When you see the tragedy that's going on in Somalia, when you see what's happening in the Sudan. Yes. Um, if America, or just, just, you know, you see current senators voicing an opinion and flexing muscle to do what they believe needs to be done to help those that would, that would argue is the least amongst us on the globe. Right. If you have these very real situations, what would be your solution to try and help them? I would send educators because quite frankly, giving them bullets to kill each other hasn't changed anything. And as Jean Kirkpatrick said when Jimmy Carter just finished with not dealing with Iran, a democracy cannot exist amongst an illiterate people. We have to, you want to send teachers, you want to send missionaries to bring people to realizations about what's in their heart and what's in the heart of those governing them. I am all for that and I'm going to support that with my own individual dollar. I don't believe we should use taxpayer dollars to do those things. But if you want to send teachers, you want to send missionaries, you will not change the hearts and minds of those who are governing and those who vote for them by just giving them bullets. It will not change. We have to send those in. And while I do believe that what's going on is evil in most of these countries, and what's called Arab Spring is more like Muslim Brotherhood move on in, quite frankly, we've continually and sadly supplanted one government in a nation and it to be replaced with one who hates us more. We don't have the best track record right now. I think we need to pray for nations and send educators. That's the end of that round. Let's go to uh, our closing statements. And uh, the first closing statement will come from Ted Cruz. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming and spending the time to be here and for investing your time and energy in this race and in making a difference in our nation. I suspect I'm not the only person in this room that's been burned by a politician. <laughs> that's seen politicians who sound really good on the stump and then they become spineless jellyfish when they get into office. We all know the old parable of the frog and the scorpion. And the scorpion stings the frog because it is his nature. Sadly, it is the nature of political candidates to say whatever it takes to try to get your vote. Which is why, over and over again, every answer to every question that was asked tonight I didn't say, take my word for it. I said, look to my record. If you want to know where my heart is, if you want to know if I care about these principles, look to if I've been standing and fighting for the principles over and over and over again. And I want yourself to ask yourself on question after question, whether it was life, whether it was protecting the border, whether it was standing up for religious liberties, whether it was defending U.S. sovereignty, whether you heard answers that pointed to a record of standing and fighting. And the reason I focus on it is two things. Number one, you want to know if someone has the backbone and courage to do it. And if they haven't done it in the past, we shouldn't expect them to grow the backbone in office. And number two, you want to know if they can do it effectively. In terms of my heart, my dad, when I was a kid, fleeing oppression over and over again said, when we faced oppression in Cuba, I had a place to flee to. If we lose our freedom here, where do we go? There's no question that better explains why I'm running for office than that question right there. I ask for your support. I need your support. I look forward to fighting arm in arm and by your side. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here, and thanks for the privilege uh, for me to be with you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, as you think about electing a new senator, or anyone, I think there's two important aspects. One, where they came from and at the core, and hopefully you've got a sense of that. I was raised by a single mom who ended up having an awful lot of problems that had been given to her by my dad. I can tell you that nobody will ever teach me anything about the working class. I saw it in my mom. And I saw her work hard, not only to put food on the table, but to create a generation, an opportunity for me that was better than hers. We have gotten to the point where everything comes down to seven second sound bites, how good we make speeches and how the applause lines are. What we've seen over the last two years, good speeches and never having led anything, is not a very good recipe for our nation. 
We need to have people that, again, don't talk about things that have not been in staff positions, but have actually had to be leaders, actually had to make the decisions and step forward. Our economy is at the precipice right now. We are on the verge of losing everything that we've built over the course of 235 years. People talk about spending, they've got it down to the paragraph. Ask if they've actually cut spending, public and private. Today, we've got a stagnant economy. We're not creating jobs. Ask if people have actually created jobs. I cannot theoretically talk about the private enterprise, but have they been in it? I have Glenn Addison. This afternoon, you've seen a small sampling of some of my thoughts. On my website are a lot of details, details about issues, details about how I have spent my 50 years on this earth. And although I have not stood before the highest court in the land, I, along with many of you, have been on my knees before our Heavenly Father, asking Him to forgive our nation for turning its back toward Him. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that many of our problems can be solved if we would look back to the founders and the foundational truths that they gave us back in the 1700s. I believe the Lord's put a burden on my heart because one person in the United States Senate can have a profound influence and difference on national policy. In Leviticus chapter 14, God gave the Jews specific instructions about what to do if mildew infested their houses. And if the infestation was significant enough, they were to dismantle the entire structure. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a major infestation of disease in the power structure of Washington, D.C. The Tenth Amendment is in shreds. Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution, which says that legislative authority belongs to the Congress is a joke, as evidenced by daily dictates from the EPA and other agencies. Those agencies must be dismantled, and their duties, their duties must be returned to the states. It's absolutely essential that their duties be returned to the states. You know, whether it's a lizard in Llano or a dam in Dallas, those decisions should be uh, made by Texans and not by bureaucrats. And so that's what a Senator Addison will be about. I ask for your support. I love that everyone talks about the founders, but we forget the million who served in ways that no one knows their name. John Adams would be a lawyer, only known in history as a lawyer who hung by his neck at, for treason if it weren't for the men and women in the ground forces of the American military as it was the Continental Army.